around the uh, book of Revelation. And right before there, there are three small books there called epistles. And those are epistles of John. And we want the third epistle of John. And verse 8. Third epistle of John, verse 8. Come to think of it, I believe it's the second epistle of John. I'm what a verse says, look to yourselves. Second John. Second John. All right, second epistle of John, verse 8. Look to yourselves that uh, we lose not what we've wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Now, that's talking about what happens to you after you're saved. Uh, your salvation is not a reward, your salvation is a free gift. But after you're saved, you've got to work for the Lord. When you wrought something, you work it out. The Bible says uh, uh, you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But the Bible doesn't say you should work at salvation. Work out salvation. You work out what God worked in. And he said, why? Because God worketh in you both to do and to will of his good pleasure. One time a little boy came forward in a revival meeting and uh, got on his knees there at the altar and was praying. And they went to, well, they went to kneel to him and do personal work with him. And he's surprised to hear the boy pray, and the boy was praying, the boy was saying, Lord, do a good job on me, do a good job on me, do a good job on me. <laughs> That's a good prayer. Yeah, right. Do a good job on me. For it's God that worketh in you both to do and the will of his, uh, uh, God, uh, the work of his good will. So after you're saved, you get to working, and then uh, he says, you better look to yourselves, take care of yourself, take heed to yourself, yet lest you lose something. Now, you can't lose your salvation. But you lose rewards. You lose what you wrought. At the judgment seat of Christ, a lot of Christians are going to see the work, uh, their life work, go up in a bonfire that make uh, Hiroshima look like a weenie roast. And the uh, fact of the matter is, many Christians aren't prepared to meet the judgment seat of, to meet the judgment seat of Christ at all. And uh, the shame in America is the Christians aren't taught these things. Uh, the most uh, the most serious thing for you possibly, and the most serious thing you possibly could get into is the fact that you're going to face the judgment seat of Christ someday and be judged for what you did after you were saved. And Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. These fellows got that thing down to where that terror of the Lord is talking about, terror of the Lord to unsaved people. But the context in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is not unsaved people. It's saved people. You know what Paul asked the Lord to do one time? He said, I got a buddy named Onesiphorus. When I was in prison, he came and sought me out and ministered to me. And because he did that, Lord, I want to have you have, uh, have mercy upon him in that day. Why would he be praying for God to have mercy on a Christian? But that's what he prayed. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I don't know what's involved there, but if Paul's praying for God to have mercy upon him and his brothers who helped him out in that day, the day of redemption, when you see the Lord, there must be something to it. Now, a Christian can lose a lot of things, and if you want to worry about something, I'll give you plenty to worry about tonight. <laughs> But there's one thing you should never worry about. You should never worry about losing your salvation. And uh, you're, you're, you're not a charismatic. Most of you aren't. And I hope you're not. I can't imagine anybody stupid enough to, think those, to put money in those ministries. I go up and down the country these days. When I, I go up and down the country these days. I, I, when I get in the audience I've never been in before, I look at them kind of suspiciously. And I say to myself, could there be anybody here who is sending money in to Benny Hinn, you know, or, uh, you know, or Kilpatrick or Stephen Hill, one of those uh, hypocritical jerks. And if there is stupid, uh, get your brain straightened out. Uh, but there must be, they get plenty of money. It's not coming from unsaved people, it's coming from professing Christians. Now, how could you be that stupid? You take all Roberts. All Roberts said God led him to build a, a $7 million uh, dental school, and if he didn't build it, uh, he'd, he'd lose his soul. Well, lose it, man, if it ain't worth that much. <laughs> I mean, I always, he said, if God, if, if this money doesn't come in, God will kill me. I always wish they sent the money in, the checks would bounce. <laughs> I mean, imagine, imagine you, you, imagine some of you people, I hope nobody here, taking somebody like that seriously. I mean, if God doesn't give me $7 million, $8 million, he's going to kill me. Oh, blow it out your nose, man. What a, what a thing, man. What a mess. What are you putting up a dental school any for? Way for you? You're a healer, ain't you? You can't. Hit. <laughs> you, a healer building a, de 
are you crazy or something? A dental school? And then some of you folks would shell out money for that? You ought to be shot. I'm telling you, man. Listen, you never met a heel in your life at Fool for the Toothache. You get a toothache, you get to a dentist, boy. <laughs> I mean, did you ever get in those root things, you know, where you lie there at night and it goes, mm -hmm, pulls you off like that. And you lie there about two hours, goes by and mm -hmm, hits you again. And you never know when it's going to hit, you know. You hit it by once every two hours, and then it'll hit, you know, 15 minutes, and then nothing for two hours, and then three of them in five minutes. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, you don't go to a healing line. You go to a dentist, get the cup, make the thing pull. So anyway, uh, you take that stuff. I, ho I, hope, I hope if you're going to worry about something, I hope you worry about something worth worrying about. If you want to worry about something, worry about like Paul did. He was afraid that his converts weren't going to hold out. He was afraid God wouldn't use him. He wanted God to use him. He worried about God not using him. Now you want to worry about something, worry about that. But don't worry about losing your salvation. You're not going to lose it. You say, why aren't you going to lose it? Because there's nothing to lose. <laughs> when David prayed, he said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Thy salvation. It's his salvation. It's mine. It's his. Don't worry about something like that. And Christians worry themselves to death about it. You know, Jack Charles one time made a movie up there. The student body made a movie on soul winning. And he wanted to make a little movie to show how people deal with people about the soul, which is a good thing. And uh, he had a, got the gun there together, and he had a door there, and a fellow go up the door and knock at the door, a personal worker, and a guy come to the door. And the guy who came to the door, of course, was one of the students, but he pretended like he was an unsaved man, just in the, in the house there. And so this student comes up and knocks at the door, this guy opened the door, and the student says, uh, Sir, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, your soul, if I might. Uh, are you saved? And the student opened the door, looked at him a minute, and said, uh, Yes. <laughs> and he said, cut. And they cut the film. And he said, look, we're trying to show up how you want a soul to Christ here. You're supposed to say, no, I'm not saved, so we can get the thing going. So they got the film going again, and the guy came up the door and knocked the door and went through the same conversation. He said, the guy, are you saved? And the guy says, yeah. <laughs> cut. <laughs> and he was almost crying. He said, I'm not about to get lost again for anybody. <laughs> And uh, that's how we are. We're not about to get lost again for anybody. But there's some things you can lose, and we'll talk about them tonight. Now, first of all, I mean, you realize, you actually realize what you've done when you got saved. I, I know I didn't. Uh, uh, somebody told me one time, they said, Ruff, you didn't get saved because you love God or anything. You just got saved because you're afraid of going to hell. I said, amen, amen. You got my number. You got my number. Just why I got saved, boy. Just plain chicken, man. That's why I got saved. I mean, I don't want to go to hell and burn third-degree burns. I've been up in the burn ward and looked at them. But you take, you know what you actually did when you got saved? You bet your soul on a book is what you did. Amen. And if the world thinks you're stupid, you can't blame them for thinking that. Who would bet their soul on a book? You would bet your soul that what that book said is so, right? Amen. Aren't you counting what God said to get you to heaven? Amen. Well, you bet, your book, you bet your soul on a book. You take a Catholic says, you just got a paper pope. That's right, I sure do. And you shall outlive your pope. <laughs> you got to change your pope every 10 or 20 years. I'm to change a page in that book, you know, for 300, just let, just let her go. But you take, uh, you take this business about uh, uh, losing your salvation, you have bet your soul of what God said was so, and what if it didn't work out? Suppose you lose your shirt. I mean, you put go your blue chips in one pile, and five-card draw, seven-card stud, you lose the whole thing. Yeah, suppose, it, suppose it isn't true. Well, I'll tell you something, and I'll, I'll give you a good word of testimony. I'm, I'm equipped now in some position to say, you know, after being out here in the battlefront for 50 years, I can tell you, if, the, if, the, if that thing turns out to be false, uh, I still have the best of it believing it. Why, if I didn't believe that thing, I'd be in hell right now. Or I'd be a drunk dying in a TB sanitarium or rescue mission someplace. If that, if that book's a lie, it's still better than going on without it. <laughs> I mean, if it isn't true, you can't lose anyway. You're in better shape than the guy that didn't believe it. So who cares? Let her rip, man. I mean, I'm, I've got all the blue chips in one pile. I'm betting it's so. And if it's so, then I'm way ahead of an unsaved man. But so he wound up in the lake of fire and I wind up in New Jerusalem.
Or I'm not on the way. You want know the charismatic say? They say, well, uh, the devil and the Holy Spirit can't dwell in the same vessel, you know. And greater is he this than you this in the world. Greater is he this than you the world. Greater is he in the world. Greater is blah, 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 blah. That don't mean a thing in this world, people. That isn't, that just says the one that's in you is greater than the devil. Well, who didn't know that? You call that a promise? <laughs> that ain't no promise. That's just a statement of fact. Amen. Greater is he that is you than he is in the world. Sure, that's true. What does it mean? Nothing. If you don't use it. So in plain words, the fact that Christ in me is greater than the devil, what does that mean? Nothing if I'm not surrendered to Christ. You take a just for a cell, a Christian can't be deemed possessed. Well, let's put it this way. All he can get of you is your eyes and ears and nose and tongue and lips and teeth and jaw and ankle and arms and legs and mind and heart and body and your testimony and your character and your inheritance and your rewards and your health and your family and your property and your life. That good enough for you? Is that enough possession for you? <laughs> the only thing you can't get is your soul. Paul said, in my body, he said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Why do you say that if all was in there was the Lord? That kind of blasphemous thing to say. If he, the one that is me, is greater than one in the world, what's this fellow, the greatest Christian ever do, live, live doing to say? I, mean, the, in my, I know me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That isn't a good thing. See? See? You must have two natures. Because one of them is no good. That's the flesh. And you let the devil have this and have that, you can lose your shirt. Now, you can't lose your soul, but you can lose your assurance. A lot of Christians doubt their salvation for years at a time. I have people phone me up and phone me up and phone me the same guy, phone them four or five times a year for six years. Finally, I get mad at them and get tired of dealing with them and get rough with them because I just can't stand a guy just constantly making a liar out of God. I mean, uh, I know they mean well, but, but the Lord said, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, did you call upon his name? Amen. How many of you did? Amen, All right, if you're not saved, somebody's lying. Amen. Either you're lying, the Lord's lying. <laughs> he said, if you call upon his name, he'd save you. He said, if you come to him, he wouldn't cast you out. Now, who's lying? Amen. You get one guess. Um, he said he saved you. If you came, you came, you didn't get saved. Somebody lying. It isn't the Lord. You can lose assurance. Christian do. Uh, we have preachers down south that are dumb enough to say, if you don't know you're saved, you've never been saved. That isn't true. I, I know hundreds of Christians that doubt the salvation. Uh, there are thousands of unsaved people that think they're saved and they're not. And there are thousands of Christians that think they're lost and they're not the saved. You say, do you ever doubt your salvation? Yeah, I doubt my salvation. You say, how often? Oh, about oh, four or five times a year. So how long do you doubt? Oh, about four or five seconds, something like that. <laughs> I don't fool it very long. And you know why? I've got, I've got a way. Now, you think it's kind of crazy, but I'll show you what it's like. It's like as if here was a bottomless pit down here with a fire in it, and I, I don't want to go, so I'm leaning on something and counting on hold me up. See? I'm leaning on this. Now, you take that out, and I'm going to drop uh, I'm going to drop that way, too. That's absolute truth. It isn't relative. <laughs> I'll go this way I want to go. <laughs> well, I'm over this pit like this, and here's a fire down here. You know what I'm uh, trusting on keeping out of the fire? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All the ground is sinking sand. I, right tonight, looking at you, I am counting in nothing but the shed blood of Christ's blood atonement to get me out of that pit. Yes, That's all I'm trusting. Amen. See, a Baptist preacher. This world, this world is full of Baptist preachers. Not worth a dime. You see, we're a Baptist. Slick Willie's a Baptist. <laughs> so is Cussing Harry Truman. I ain't going to get you anywhere. All I'm depending on what Christ did for me to save me. Now, if that doesn't work, I'm lost. So I go like this. The devil comes around and says, you're not saved. I say, well, okay, maybe I'm not tough apples. The devil comes around and says, well, you couldn't be saved and think like things like that. You couldn't be saved and say things like that. Uh, my soul, if I'm going to hell, leave me alone. I'm having a good time. <laughs> you ain't going to move me, man. I know what I'm well off. Look at here. Look at here, boys and girls. If that don't work, nothing works. 
Trouble some of you getting like the devil comes around and said, Now, did you have faith when you felt it, or did you feel it before you had faith, or did you receive when you believed, or did you have faith when you believed, or did you believe in your heart, or believe in your head, or did you. And you say, Well, I don't know whether I did or not. Yeah. Well, you know, I come to think of it, I didn't used to do that before I was saved, and I do it now. And I think of that, and sometimes, uh, sometimes I think, Well, I don't remember even slaying the Spirit, I don't remember getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost, so maybe I was baptized wrong. <laughs> you fool. <laughs> if that can't get you to heaven, just relax, you're going to hell. Just quit and enjoy it, okay? <laughs> if that can't keep you out of hell, nothing can keep you out of hell. So don't drive yourself crazy worrying about it. You take, you used to have a, a, a good preacher up here, a good friend of mine, his name was uh, Joe Fleming, pastor of Eight Baptist Temple. I preached for him every year about, I guess, about eight, nine years, and his wife was always worried about losing her salvation. And she worried about it, worried about it, worried about it. Every time an evangelist came in there, she'd call him aside and, and tell him she was, thought she was lost, didn't know what she was saved, what to do about this, what to do about that. And all of them talked with her. And I remember one time we were going to the airport, we were driving along the airport, and I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw a car following us, uh, pretty high, high speed. I said, who's that? He said, it's my wife. And I said, what's she doing? He said, she wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, well, the airport will be all right. So we got to the airport and got out. She came there in a sweat, and she worried about her salvation. And there had been a two-week meeting, something like that, soul saved and everything. And I said, well, I said, now, let me, let me ask you this, sister. I said, do you want to go to hell when you die? And she said, no, 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 I don't want to go to hell when I die. I said, well, uh, what are you trusting on keeping you out of hell? And she said, well, I, I know the answer to that. I said, don't give me the answer to it. Tell me what you're trusting. Um, you don't want to go to hell when you die. You're trusting something to keep you out of hell. What are you trusting? And she said, well, I know what you should believe and should say. I said, don't tell me that. <laughs> what are you trusting? Amen. And she said, uh, face just white and scared. She said, I'm trusting the blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, well, I've got bad news for you, sister. She almost fainted. She said, what, what, what? I said, you want to go to hell, but you ain't going to make it. You're going to have to go to heaven whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the truth. What the book says. You bet your soul in the book. Uh, you can lose your assurance of salvation. I had a fellow used to phone me up, and he'd phone me up about, oh, maybe once every three or four months, and he'd phone from Panama City, long distance. And it was always late at night. It was always after 12. And he'd phone up, most time he'd be drunk. And the first time he phoned me, he said, uh, Father, I need to talk to you. <laughs> but I was a Catholic priest, you know. And I just let him do that. He was all right with me. You know, I'm a father. I've had 13 kids. I, I qualify. And he said, Father, he said, he said, Father, he said, uh, I, I'll not talk to you. He said, I, I, I'm going to hell and I'm lost and I, I, I'm a very bad, wicked sinner and I, I want to talk to you about getting saved. I said, Good, man. And I come over the phone about 30 minutes and he prayed and asked the Lord to save him and put him with the Spirit and everything and seemed very happy about it and hung up. And about two months later, he phones up again. This father, I need to talk to you. I, I, I can't get any sleep. I don't think I'm really saved. I said, and we went through it again. You got assurance. How about three months later, phone up again. And he said, uh, preacher, you don't understand. He said, I, I've done a lot of uh, terrible things. I've killed a lot of men. I said, well, it's tough apples. Sometimes it's allowed. Military action, Romans 13, self-defense, manslaughter. He said, but I'm in cold blood. I'm in cold blood. He never did give you his name either. Boy, the hit man, evidently. And he said, uh, when I go to bed at night, he said, I, I see all these people I've killed. And I said, listen, did you pray and ask Christ to save you a couple months back? Yeah. Did you put your faith in his blood? Yeah. Well, that book says, come now, saith the Lord, let us reason together. Though you are sin to be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And I said, I said, if it is murder, tough apples, under the blood, forget it. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cleanse us from all sin, but murder, it cleanses us from all sin, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And about a month later, up he phones tonight, drunk. Father, I need to talk to you. And I, and I was, by then I was put out with him. I said, listen, buddy, I said, I want to tell you something. You may worry about those dead people in your dying day, and the devil may drive you nuts for that. You may want to blow your brains out. I don't know. But God said if you'd come to him, he'd save you. And you did, and he'd save you. You call upon him, he'd save you. The blood covers small sin. And you're saved. You have to pay the rest of your life for the wicked life you lived. But it won't affect your soul. Amen. And hung up. I don't know what happened to that fellow. That must be a tough thing. 
go to bed at night and still face all the people you, you murdered. Must be a tough thing. And uh, maybe God will take it out of his mind. Maybe he won't. I don't know. You reap what you sow. But if you lose an arm before you're saved, it don't grow back when you get saved. All right, you can lose assurance. That's for certain. You can lose assurance. You say, well, how do you know you're saved? Well, how do you know you're married? <laughs> you know you're married? So how do you know you're married? Well, you know you're married. You've got a, a wedding license. you got it in writing. I got my salvation in writing. Yeah. In the book. John 5, 24. I mean, you took your vows on an altar, I suppose. I came to the altar and confessed Christ my Savior. You're living with your wife. You're married. You're supposed to be living with her. I'm living with Christ. He's in me and I'm in him. I know as much as I'm saved as I know I'm married. I know I'm saved as much as I was born. I got a birth certificate when I was born. It's in writing. I got a verse there that says, Verily I say to you, he that heareth my word be with him sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, Amen. but is passed from death to life. That's me. That's me. Amen. Trouble is you count on your experience, you know. Well, I was in a room, you know, the fellow said I was going one the night I got to say, boy, he said, I saw a fireball across the room and my hair stood on end, you know, that kind of thing. And that won't do any good if somebody's bald. <laughs> I mean, you can't depend on your hair standing in to take care of it. These dumb, stupid, charismatic men. I saw a man, he said to me, you should have thrown an inkwell at him. But that's, what, that's what Luther did. When he saw Christ at the foot of his bed there, you know, and he said, I'm Christ, he threw an inkwell at him. You can go there to Württemberg, wherever that was, and find the ink splash still on the wall there. Luther had better sense. Luther said, you're not here in this room. You're up in heaven. You're up in heaven, the right hand of God. If you're Christ, you're not Christ. Bap! And slung an inkwell at him. He had more sense than this charismatic bunch, I'll tell you. All right? You don't go by the feeling. You go by what God said. Now, there's something else you can lose. You can lose your testimony. What's your testimony? Your testimony is what you stand for. Uh, I'm not talking about your reputation. Your reputation may be one thing. Your testimony may be another. But a man's testimony is what he professes to believe, what he professes to stand for. And if a man's testimony stands, uh, people, whether they like it or not, or believe him or not, or get along with him or not, or hate his guts or not, doesn't make any difference. If a man has a solid testimony, they know that he believes what he's saying. It's got weight. Because they know what they, they might not even believe it. But your testimony, what you're testifying uh, to, that you know or you believe, you profess to believe. And you can lose that testimony. Uh, you take, uh, uh, if somebody not believing in your profession of faith. Years ago in England, a very funny thing happened. There were two boys growing up at that time in the Royal Palace, Buckingham Palace. And that was Albert, the Duke of Windsor, who was about that time 10 years old, and Edward, the Prince of Wales. And they were heirs to the throne, the English throne they were. And those two little boys were 10 and 12, and one winter day they were watching a bunch of street urchins out there in the street throwing snowballs. And a boy is a boy, whether he's a Duke of Windsor, you know, or the Prince of Wales, he's a boy. And those two boys watch those fellas playing out there and throwing uh, uh, snowballs at each other and using garbage can lids for shields and things, and they want to get out and get in it. So they slipped down the back end of Buckingham Palace and got through the gate without the guard seeing them got out the street and started throwing the snowballs at those kids, those little uh, beggars' kids out in the street, and a snowball went through Buckingham Palace window and broke a window. Boy, it broke a window every garden the place was out there, and they ran around these street urchins. They just headed for the bushes all down the alleys running, and they grabbed the two little, the, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Windsor. They got them, and one other little kid with snot running out his nose, you know, and about 12 years old, looked like he was about 16. <laughs> And they grabbed him and shook him up and said, all right, now, who are you? Who are you, huh? And the first boy said, I I'm Albert, Duke of Windsor. <laughs> and he said, a likely story. <laughs> and then <laughs> jammed up the other one. He said, and what are you, what do you got to say for yourself? So, you scoundrel. And he said, he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Edward, Prince of Wales. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you sure you are. And he said, and you? <laughs> the kid said, I'll stick by my mate, sir. I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> now, you know he couldn't get him to believe that. I mean, that testimony just, it didn't go, you know. You, you can lose your testimony. Lose your testimony. Can you ever just stop thinking about what uh, 
You know Simon Peter, you know, denied the Lord. That servant girl he denied a couple times too. Just stop thinking about how strange it would have been if that servant girl had showed up at Pentecost. Well, I wonder if she was there and saw Simon Peter get in that soapbox. You know, repent, you know, and that girl saying, well, well, that's the fellow who was down at that fire the other night, cussing. Don't you know his testimony was shot with that girl? I mean, she wouldn't believe anything after hearing that guy cursing and swearing, but he was a Christian. He just lost his testimony. Uh, years ago, I had a friend, and he's still alive. His name was Tyner, and Tyner was a missionary. Tyner was one of these rolling, rolling stone missionaries that uh, isn't uh, particularly burdened about any of you. He's just a worldwide Roman missionary, <laughs> but he stays a long time in one place. I mean, Ethiopia about 10 years, and Spain about four years, and right now as he's working in Russia, I think, of the Ukraine, Tyner, uh, he, he's in Russia. And uh, you take that fellow, he's worked in South Africa about eight years. He's had, I think he said, uh, 51 cancers, skin cancers removed from his face after being in South Africa. And that old boy, he, was, he used to be a GI in the Army in Korea. And the Army in Korea, I tell you, I got saved. He, he was, there was a fellow there, one of his friends there in the, uh, in the Army, that he'd go out and run around with and live like the devil with. And they were down the cat houses, you know, and the and stuff on leave and drinking together and gambling together and all the stuff. And <clears throat> one time there after a bad, cold week there, and one of those 20, 30 below zeros, he's on a recon and came into a hut there, and there were 50 dead Americans there with their throats slit, frozen. And those fellows had been lying in there in, in the cold, you know, they were kind of their throats slit before they froze, after they froze, but uh, the goose came in at night, and the patrol there went in there and killed those fellows and left them there with their throats cut, blood frozen, 50 corpses in that one hut there. And Tyner saw that and shook him up bad. And he went back, and he, for the next day, he was just, just off by himself most of the time, and uh, his buddy saw him out there sitting on a pile of ammo boxes and said, What you doing, Tyner? And he said, I'm just thinking. So what you thinking about? He said, I'm thinking about religion. And his buddy said, Oh, you don't know nothing about religion. And he said, Well, do you? <laughs> and his buddy said, Sure, I know about religion, man. I'm an ordained minister. <laughs> and Tyner said, You are. And he said, Sure. You know what that fellow did? He said, I'm an ordained minister, and Tyner said, I looked at him, and he said, you know something? He said, you're the meanest devil I ever met in my life. He said, you mean you and me have been living life, we've been living around here doing the stuff we've been doing, you're a minister? You're the meanest devil I ever met in my life. And when he said that, that kid just stood there like he was just hit with a plank, and he turned around and walked off, stumbled off. Well, Tyner got saved a couple of months later, and then after the war was over, he came back through Frisco, come back to the States, and in Frisco, he saw that fellow's name in the thing there. He was leading singing for a pastor there in a church in Frisco, and by then, the kid had got right, and he went to see him, you know, and that fellow ran down off the platform out in the middle of the song service and grabbed him and hugged him, just crying all over him, and apologized to him. He said, Brother, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me for doing what I did there. God, I'm right now. Brother, I want to... You pray for me, brother, and that kind of thing. He got his testimony back. Yeah. Peter got his back. Yeah. But he lost it there for a while. You can lose your testimony. That is all you can lose your joy. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yeah. When you lost the joy, you lost your strength. Yeah. You can lose the joy. You know what David prayed? David said, uh, restore unto me the joy right. of thy salvation. And you can lose the joy. Uh, the Bible says that's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. That's the main thing that's missing among Christians today. And they, they counter, the charismatics counterfeit by getting a, a bunch of jungle music going and start through the belly dance and the bumps and the grinds and they get this feeling and all start hollering and shouting, boy, it sure feels good, it sure feels good. Yeah, dope does too. Yeah, you get, you get a rise off crack, you know, Mary Jane, the Mexican sleigh ride. You, you, can, you, get, you get all kinds of stuff, see. But uh, that isn't joy. Joy is something that's real and deep, and something that joy is it's not like fun. Joy is rejoicing, not in a feeling, it's rejoicing in Christ. We are those that rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh, Paul says. It's rejoicing in your salvation. 
uh, anybody, anybody on this earth ought to rejoice that it should be Baptist. Say Baptist, because you know where you're going when you die. That's something to get happy about. You don't need any music to get happy about that. I've been out, I've been out mother fishing at night by myself out there in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, and been out there, oh, about to 11 o'clock at night, and at night I didn't think I'd catch any fish, and go along there and throw in that net, and got seven of them in one throw, brought them on the beach, and I didn't have my bag, we didn't have enough faith to carry a bag or a cooler with me, so I buried them in the sand, and go out and throw again, and get six more, and go out and throw again, and get eight more, I mean, you know, two, three pounds, and I'm hollering all over that beach. I haven't got any jungle music. I haven't got any hallelujah, 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 what's it to you, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> that kind of bunk. I haven't got that kind of stuff. I'm catching fish. <laughs> and the Lord's given me these, this fish. Amen. That's something to rejoice about. Amen, One time in a, in a school, a teacher asked a, the ch- children a question, and one question was, what, what do Christians shout when they get happy? And a kid said, Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of truth in that. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. Of course, that isn't it. All right, you lose the joy, and you lost the joy. So these things I write, that your joy may be full. Ask and, re- and receive, that your joy may be full. That's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you're, you're to enjoy your salvation and rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Christians get down in the, in the mouth and get uh, backslidden and lose the joy. I've seen them lose it. I let a fellow of Christ one time, his name was Cecil Ford, and he was a, over in Vietnam, a GI over there, a grunt, and he had a buddy in the, in the a medic there named Bonnie, a Japanese medic, and he led ja- uh, Bonnie to the Lord. And that fellow wanted to come to Pensacola Bible Institute, and every time he'd get ready to come, he'd re-up, get back in the service. And he told me he was called to preach, but about the third time he re-upped and didn't come to school, I said to him, I thought you were called to preach and come to school, and he confessed that he was afraid to get out of the army. And by the time a fellow's been in the army 10 or 12 years, you understand it. I mean, you're floating, everything's paid for. Everything's paid for, room, board, uniform, everything, medical care, insurance, all that stuff, and a fellow gets wondering, if I got out, could I make it? I was up against that after World War II, and I think he could have made it, but he's afraid to. And he never did come. And then his family broke up, and then he got stepped out with his wife, and the family broke up, and then he married a Vietnamese girl, and then uh, that thing ended a divorce, and then he tried to drink things off, and then he married a Catholic girl, an unsaved girl, and that went to pieces, and at that, that divorce case, he jumped over the bench and hit the judge, and he got some time for it, and when he finally, it's Christian, just the same you are. And he came to me one day out in the backyard, had a loaded 38, and he came and sat down next to me just crying, just crying like a baby. And said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it off, uh, uh, Brother Peter. said, I just can't, I can't go the way I'm going. I just can't, I can't make it. I just can't make it. I can't make it. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and blow my brains out. I said, well, don't make too big a mess thing. Put it in your mouth if you're going to do it right. I mean, you shoot here sometimes and go around the top. You know, only wind up a vegetable. And if you're going to do it right, put it in your mouth and blow the top of your head off. I, I'm real sympathetic with these people, you know, they get <laughs> talking. And he said... I've tried to live like the devil, but I can't do it. And he said, I'll be out. He said, I'll be out dating some bluesy out in the beer joint someplace. And about the time things get going, he said, she'll turn to me and look at me and say, you scare me. <laughs> and he'll say, what do you mean I scare you? She said, I don't know. There's something about you just reminds me of God. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you know, about breaking up a night, boy, that'll mess it up. <laughs> and you know something? Once you, get, once you get in that book, it'll ruin you for life, man. You're thinking of going back and out in the world. Just don't waste your time doing it. Uh, God will hunt you down and put a, put a hurricane in the ship, boy. They'll find you. They'll find you. I know I'm thought of like that. This brother's up there singing and playing the piano. You know, he did a good job. And I've got a buddy who does that, uh, Rex Harrison, a crippled fella that plays the piano and sings. And he got terrible backslidden when he was younger. I mean, uh, he was saved. He went off down to California. His job was playing, uh, playing uh, piano with honky-tonks and bars and discos and singing. He had to know all the songs by heart. No sheet music. He learned them all by heart, could play them by heart. Play them without sheet music. And one night out there, some old bimbo came around. She was leaning on the piano there, you know, and drinking her cocktail. And she was running down her face. And after thing was, he finished singing some song. And when he got through, she said, uh, I bet you're a Christian, aren't you? <laughs> and he said, 
Why do you say that? She said, I can just tell by the way you sing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, once you get in that book, you're ruined for life. Amen. You might just well decide to tough it out and go on home to heaven, man, because it's going to be a mess you try any other thing. You lose the joy. You don't want to save people. They don't have any joy. They act like they're having fun, but they don't have any joy. And they, 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 they kid themselves about it. Unsaved people tell themselves they're having a good time when they're not having a good time. Now, I know how that goes. I know how that goes. I mean, uh, I've been out many a bender back in the old days and drunk at night. And the next day, the boys get talking about it. And you say, yes, yeah, so-and-so, hey, you see him, man, he fell in the bathtub, man. Yes, yeah, so-and-so fell down the stairs. Hey, <laughs> right there, the old puke, ha, 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 you know. You're having fun. <laughs> getting drunk and getting sick and wasting your money what a dumb thing to do see but you keep telling yourself it's great you know you smoke a cigarette boy it tastes good I remember the first cigar I smoked out behind the barn when I was about uh, 11 it didn't taste good I turned just green as grass man I was sick for about three days the first beer I tasted didn't taste good, you know, ah, smooth, middle of high life, you know, you know, give me a light, you know. Do you remember how the first one tastes? Or the first whiskey or scotch you ever drank? You don't, t you tell yourself it tastes good because you want to have them think you're a man, see. It tastes terrible. <laughs> it tastes horrible, man, make you puke. <laughs> I'm out of cigar now for 50 years. And I, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not tempted to go back to them, although I must admit that sometimes on a, on a Sunday after a big Sunday dinner, when I'm leaving the place and look under the glass case there and see the mirror and red dot and white owl and have a tamp and tamp and nuggets, you know. They're the good ones. They're the black the back of those. I kind of, you know, just... <laughs> you kind of... But I, I've got better sense to try one. If I took one of them things right now, I'd be just sicker than a sick sow in a snowstorm, man. Because my body is, would reject it. No alcohol tobacco for 50 years. Thank God. I'm sorry there ever was 27 before that word got in there. But I've had time to outlive it. <laughs> By the grace of God. But they, they kid themselves. You get, you get in the habit of doing things. You just, um, I got a friend down there in Pensacola. He's, he's dead now. He used to run a serviceman center. And his name is Clay Hadley. And Clay Hadley used to pick up servicemen and bring them to our church. Almost always they'd get saved. A bunch of them got called to preach. Matter of fact, a bunch of them in the ministry right now. He had a bunch of charismatics on his board that didn't want him to bring them to our church all the time, so he had to take them to the other churches. And they tried to mess them up doctrinally. But at any rate, he picked about four or five guys up in the neighbor air station, was riding around the town with them. They are in the back seat talking. I mean, these, these Navy men, you know, and they're saying, oh, what a nothing town this is, boy, man. How to get back to Norfolk, this Pensacola, man. What a, what a hick town this is. Nothing to do around here, man. What a lousy, you know. They, they talked over it for 30 minutes. And finally, Clay had me driving the... They said, well, why don't you come with me to the revival meeting tonight and, and hear something new? And they said, oh, no, we can't do that. And he said, why not? And they said, we're having too good a time. <laughs> they're having a rotten time. You just talk yourself into it. You get in the habit of doing something, and those habits, so sometimes it gets in a real mess, you know. I knew a guy back in the radio days when he used to, have, they used to advertise uh, coffee and, and, and drinks and stuff, uh, coffee and cigarettes and stuff. And uh, they, uh, they, he, he, he had, his, had a, some kind of commercial taken for a, a film, and for years and years he'd been drinking a cup of coffee. I forget the Sank or Maxwell House or something. And he'd say, ah, man, that's real coffee. He'd done that for about four or five years, and one time I had him do a cigarette ad, and he took, took the film and he went, man, that's real coffee. <laughs> He's supposed to say, that's real tobacco, <laughs> but he just been saying, man, that's real coffee. <laughs> we, had a, we, had a, we had an airplane pilot, a jet pilot down in Panama City that pulled up behind a truck to park and just ran right in the back end of about 10 miles an hour. Just slap right, just on the curb. He got out red faced, you know, and they talked to them, police and stuff, and finally somebody said, What in the world did, how could you do that? He said, Well, he said, and he's ashamed to admit, red in the face. He said, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it. He said, But when I saw I was about to hit him, I pulled up on the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the steering wheel, he went, <laughs> Bam, right into it, man. You got to break it. That's, that's habit. That's habit. 
We had a guy in Pensacola jump out of the car and just unbuckle his belt and his pants dropped through the ground. He had to grab them and pull them back up. And he, he thought when he unbuckled his pants, he thought he was unbuckling the seat belt. And he hadn't buckled the seat belt. And he just really unbuckled his pants and <laughs> blammed down the cane. Now I want to say people just tell themselves this little story over and over again. I'm having a good time. I'm having a good time. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. Not a real good time. Brethren, bless your soul. Let me tell you something. In the couple of Gethsemanes I've had since I've been saved, and I've been pretty low in the valley a couple of times, and way down there at the bottom when the worst kind of stuff was going on, everything was just torn to pieces, I can remember an, uh, there was underground subconscious flow there that's just steady and sustains you right through it, and that's better than all the fun you'll ever have playing any disco in this world. Because I've played in them. Telling you the truth. You lose your joy. You can lose your rewards. You read in that, we were asking questions this morning, and they are talking about uh, the inheritance, and the inheritance, of course, is the millennial inheritance. And the millennial inheritance is uh, rewards, have uh, rule over ten cities, have rule over five cities, and the reward is the judgment seat of Christ. Every man shall receive uh, a reward according to his labor, and if God to work a bird uh, that he had built that upon, he shall receive a reward for the reward you can get. And John, in your text says, let us uh, look, to us, look to yourselves that you receive a full reward for what you've done. You can lose reward in the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, not your salvation, but because you could have prayed and didn't, could have praised God and didn't, could have given and didn't, could have attended the services and didn't, and could have witnessed and didn't, and some of you don't, you're not going to. Because that kind of thing, uh, you can lose rewards when the judgment seat of Christ shows up. The picture of that in the Bible is a fellow named Esau. And Esau is a picture of a carnal Christian. And he's a picture of a carnal Christian who uh, wants it all now. And he got hungry and traded his birthright in for a bowl of chili. That's what red pottage is. Red pottage is red kidney beans. It's chili. And he traded that in. He traded his birthright in for a mess of pottage, the Bible says. And then later he came to his daddy and said, uh, and his daddy said, Who art thou? And he said, uh, Thy son Esau. And he said, Who? And he said, Esau. He said, Esau. Well, I've just blessed Esau. He'd been out here. I've just blessed him. And Esau cried with a loud and bitter cry and said, My brother has stolen my blessing. And he said, How, Hast thou not a blessing for me, even for me also, O my father? And he said, uh, how can I bless you? I blessed him, gave him corn and wine, and sustained him. And I did this and did that. And he said, have, give me a blessing, O my father. And the New Testament said, he saw the place of repentance carefully with tears and didn't find it. That's a Christian who lost his reward for just taking the temporary. You want it right now? Okay, you got it. Up there, you won't get nothing. You get up there, he says, barely they have their reward here. You get up there, you'll get nothing to show for it. Now, that's to be a sad thing, and you don't think about it, some of you don't think about it seriously now, but you will then. And you'll get up there, and you'll see what you could have had uh, because you'd served the Lord, and you were selfish, and said, well, just as long as I make it to heaven, I'll be satisfied, and I don't want any rewards, I'm not ambitious, I, I just, if I can just get to heaven, I'll be satisfied. No, you won't. You won't go home tonight and find your house burned to the ground, all your records burned, and all your... Uh, equipment burned and all your furniture burned and all your kids burned to death you won't invite me for a stakeout tomorrow night and say well I made it I got here at least I'm, I didn't burn no you won't now you can lose those rewards uh, years ago I used to be a radio announcer at a place called WABB in Mobile Alabama I worked two there earlier for WKRG in Mobile Alabama and and then over there, in, the, in I was working for WAR over in Pensacola. I used to be a radio announcer, among other things, and a disc jockey. I'd be disc jockey in the daytime and a drummer in a dance band at night. And I had a fellow working on me, uh, working with me there at the radio station in WKRG in Mobile, Alabama, whose name was uh, Bill Alexander. And Bill Alexander was the engineer. I'd be, uh, I'd be in, the, in the announcer's booth, and he'd be behind the console and queuing up the records and stuff. I worked with him off and on for about two years, and uh, he smoked and drank, you know, and we could and talk around, dirty jokes and stuff, and uh, then I got saved, and I got saved, and after I got saved, I went back and tried to witness to all the guys I worked with in radio, 
radio announcers and engineers and station managers and program directors. I got to witness to all of them. I couldn't find Bill Alexander. And somebody said, he's over at uh, Fernadina Beach, north of Jacksonville. And I said, well, I need to see him. And they gave him his address. I had a couple of meetings for Bob Gray and went over there. And a couple of times, the first couple of times I went over there, I couldn't find him. And about the third trip, trying up there, I found him. And I came to this low, dirty, well, beaten down little, all oh, those times, it was about a $4,000 house with two bedrooms and a bathroom. There about five kids in there and a place, a dirty place, his wife in dirty clothes, sitting there like a bum with his undershirt on, drinking beer. And I came in and sat in front of him, you know, he was stubbing out cigarettes. And I came in and sat down in front of him and I said, do you remember me, Bill? He said, sure, sure, Pete, man, I remember you. How you doing, man? I said, I'm doing fine. Uh, he said, well, he said you, you, you still look pretty young. And, of course, I do, and I've been through the Bible then about, uh, oh, about 40 times. He'll do something for your face. Hugh, uh, Hugh Pyle has a little biography he wrote called The Time of My Life, and in that he has one chapter in there leading me to Christ. And when he put that chapter in there, John R. Rice and Curtis Hudson wouldn't publish the book because that was in there. The bold, militant defenders of the faith. Hey, bud, take a long walk on a short pier, okay? I mean, the big, great, big, strong, spiritual giants. <laughs> Hugh Powell wrote articles for the soul of the Lord for 20 years and had John R. in to preach for him in three churches. And he had one chapter there on how he led me to Christ and they wouldn't publish the book. He had to get an independent publisher to publish it. Godly, spirit-filled punks. Amen, amen, amen. You don't amen, amen, amen myself. I know what I'm saying. Punk, as in P-U-K, punk with a capital P. Punk. I haven't got the grace God gave an alley cat. Anyway, in that book, you know what Hugh Pyle says? Hugh Pyle talks about leading me to Christ. and the end of that passage, he says... He said, uh, when I led Peter up from the Lord, he said he was 27 years old, but he looked like he was 40. And he said, I never met a more amazing uh, change or transfiguration of man in my life. He said, two months later, he said, uh, Peter Ruffman looked like he was 25 years old. And it's true, but it was that book. And I sat in front of Bill, and he was, he was by then, he was about, must have been about 40. And his hand was trembling with the coffee, you know, and... <coughs> you know, with the cigarettes. And uh, I said, uh, Bill, I said, you know, when I was working over there at uh, WAI with you and WABB in Mobile, he said, yeah. I said, you know something? He said, what? I said, I was just a lost son on my way to hell. And he said, oh, oh no, yeah, I know you were all right, Pete. You were a good fella. I said, don't kid me. I know what I was. I said, I was going to hell. I said, are you a Christian, Bill? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, are you saved? He said, yeah. I said, when did you get saved? Oh, he said, I got saved when I was 15 years old. And I said, would you tell me something? I said, would you tell me why in all the year we worked together, you never said a word to me about Jesus Christ? Amen. I said, I could have gone to, tried, died and gone to hell any minute, and you, you never said a word to me about Christ. What do you got to say about that? I never saw a man so in such agony in all my life. And he said, well, Peter said, you know how you are. You know how you are. I said, yeah, I know how I am, but you and I worked in the same booth there together. You had plenty of time to talk. You had plenty of time to talk about everything. How come you didn't witness to me? I thought I left that fellow almost in tears. And he should have been. He should have been. What did he do? He lost, he lost his rewards. Life just gone up in smoke. I don't know what he's doing right now. He sure lost a mess of stuff there. Or I tell you something else you can lose. You see, there's plenty you can lose before you lose your soul. You can lose your health. Now, I'm no fanatic, fanatic about these things. I know many of God's people have to put up with health problems because that's the road for their life. It was for Paul. Paul had a doctor with him all his life. When he died, he said, only Luke was with me. Luke was a physician. You know what Paul called Luke? He called him the beloved physician, Colossians chapter 3. You know what the Apostle Paul told Timothy to do when he, after the apostolic age was over? He said, drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake, not often infirmities. He recommended medicine. Well, how come these charismatics are kind of screwed up on that? 
Paul, a doctor with him all his life, recommended him medicine to one of his buddies. At the end of Paul's life, when the apostolic age is over, you know what he does? He says, I've left Trophimus at Melita sick. He couldn't heal one of his buddies toward the end and recommended medicine to Timothy. And Timothy was sick. Now, I don't think all sickness is the devil. I don't believe that. And I don't believe that God, uh, some of you are sick all the time because of your backslidden out of fellowship with God. I know Paul wasn't. He wasn't sick because of his backslidden out of fellowship with God. He was sick so I'd humble him and keep him close to God. One of our friends up in the hospital in the charismatic said to him, he just had an amputation in his leg. He was learning how to walk on crutches. A preacher, the fine preacher, loved the Lord and believed the book. And the charismatic said, uh, how come, how come if you're a Christian and a spirit filled, you're on crutches? And he said, how come you're spirit filled and you're not? <laughs> I mean, the greatest Christian that ever lived was filled with the spirit was a sick man all his life. And he said, I glory in mine infirmities. So I'm no fanatic on it. But still, you have to recognize the fact that Paul said, for this cause many among you, that's the Christians, are sick, sickly, and some sleep. Some are weak, and some are sickly, and some sleep the dead. Because we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. When we are judged with chasing the Lord, that we should not be condemned of the world. So it's possible that uh, if you don't live right, and don't do right, and don't uh, stay in fellowship with the Lord, he'll make you sick on a dog and run up your hospital bills over your head. There's a possibility. And it's about something you can lose. You can lose your health. To lose your wealth is much to lose your health is more. To lose your soul is such a loss as no man can restore. I believe the most valuable thing you've got outside of salvation is your health. That's the most valuable thing you've got. All right, now you can lose your health. You don't uh, do things right. Uh, how come the charismatics always have so many healers believe in healing? I think it's because most of them have the most sick people. <laughs> you know down Brownsville? They've got 30 parking places there for the handicapped at the Brownsville Revival. What's the matter, stupid? Can't you heal anybody? <laughs> you have to have 30 places for handicapped? How come you have to keep one of some of them get well and you come out of the place that are handicapped? I, I, before, years ago when I had much more time than I've got now, I used to go to those holiness meetings. And I originated the Holy Life. I'm the one. I mean, I mean, 20 years ago I was going to those meetings just laughing my head off. <laughs> And they thought I was laughing with them, you know. <laughs> I was laughing at them. And, and I had a fellow with me named John Hall, a wheelchair fellow, and he'd go there, and he knew it was a bunch of fakey stuff. And after a while, he'd been shot with a machine gun in the Korean War and uh, crippled for life. And one day he said to me, I don't want to go to those meetings anymore with you, Brother Ruckman. I said, well, okay, you don't have to. He said, you know why? I said, no, but I'm not going to question it. And he said, well, he said, Brother Ruckman, he said, uh, you know, he said, I know they're lying. I know they're a bunch of crooks. I know they're a bunch of fakers. But he said, every time I hear them sing, only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe. I want to get out of this wheelchair so bad I can taste it. And I don't want to go to those meetings anymore. I don't blame him. You know something? I get thinking about that, and I think to myself, any man that stands where I'm standing and make you think that I was your hope for getting healed, when I didn't have enough faith to believe it, and I was a fake trying to get your money, and then blame you for not getting healed, and said it was your lack of faith that kept you sick. That is the most dirty, crummy, rotten, low-down, dirty scoundrel on the face of this earth. Taking advantage of the handicapped and sick people like that. You dirty, miserable, wicked wretch, you. You ungodly devil. Amen. 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 All that stuff. I watch those fellows, and I'd, I'd go down, I'd watch them go down and watch them heal, heal, heal and cast out demons and stuff. I'd get laughing so hard, I'd hardly stand up. They call that the holy laugh. <laughs> it wasn't me. They knew what it was me. It was an unholy laugh with me. You can lose your health. I got a friend, uh, I had a friend, he's dead now, Brother Alex Dunlap. I wish everybody in the world could have known Alex Dunlap. Alex Dunlap was a six foot seven Presbyterian Scotch Protestant who ran the conversion center in Philadelphia for for saved nuns and priests. And I've seen the bullet holes in his window and the rocks collection he had for the Catholics through and through the window. And I've, every year around the fall when the leaves would dry up, they'd set fire to his yard and try to burn the house down. He's a character. And Alex Dunlap, one of the crudest, I mean, he'd make me look like a liberal. Honest to God, man. I mean, Alex Dunlap, you never heard a more crude, uncouth character in your life. 
I mean, I'd have a meeting up there, and I'd give the invitation, three or four Catholics get saved, and come down and sit in the row, brand new can look converts, and the Dunlap would get up. And he'd say, all right, now you've just been saved down there. Now you've just learned the truth. You've been following a lie all your life. You know the Pope's a lie now. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I'm sitting back there saying, oh, my God, man, get off the back, man. Give him a chance, man. He's saying, now you don't know no lies of the truth. Now you want the truth. You're going to get out of the church as quick as you can, right? <laughs> oh, my stars, man. But you just got the feet on the ground, you know. That's the way he was. We're driving along a car one day, and he says, uh, how about so-and-so, one of your graduates? Would he make a good worker at the conversion center? I said, yeah, he'd do, he'd do a pretty good job. He said, well, what do you got to say about him? I said, well, he's a, he's a good fellow. He's a soul winner, a good fellow. He said, you don't seem to be too enthusiastic about him. <laughs> and I said, well, he's all right. He said, well, what's wrong with him? <laughs> and I said, well, he tends to gossip too much. And he said, now, don't go talking about him behind his back that way. And I said, hey, man, I said, pull over the curb here, and we'll get him the phone and throw him up, and I'll let you listen. I'll tell him what I just told you right then, and you listening, okay? And he said, just check it, just check it. <laughs> <laughs> Dunlap's a character. He's a character. He had went to a Christian business men meeting, full gospel fellowship, all that bunch, all those charismatics, you know, and unsaved businessmen sitting there, you know, and a, and a priest got up. And I had the priest come, and he said he had the gift of healing, and uh, do you want to be healed? I'll pray for you and that kind of thing. And so he got up with his gift of healing and went around and took a request. And he came to Alex, and Alex got up and said, uh, Yeah, uh, you got the gift of healing? Yeah. He said, You lay hand on the sick, they recover? Yes. He said, Okay. Lay hands on me, I'm sick. I want to get, I want to get well right now. He said, What's your problem? He said, My hair. My hair, I'm bald. I want my hair to grow back in. <laughs> and the priest said, Well, we'll pray about that, son. He said, I didn't say pray about it. Lay hands on me and recover. Uh, I want to be healed. I want some hair. And the priest got red in the face said, right now? I said, yeah, right now. And he said, well, I don't think this, you know. And he said, uh, oh, the truth of the matter is about you just a fake, aren't you? And he said, no, I'm not a fake. And he said, well, give us a word of testimony. Tell us how you got saved. About 50 businessmen sitting there. And he said, well, I don't think anybody here would be interested in that. <laughs> and that old drunk said, yeah, I think I'd be real good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that old... Dunlap reached in his pocket and he pulls out a wafer. So he goes by the Catholic Supply Center and buys these wafers they use in the mass. <laughs> and he pulled up this wafer and he said, Now tell him the truth about it. That's your God, ain't it right? That ain't your God about that wafer. Isn't that your God? And the priest said, Yes. See, when that, when that daylight Halloween costume figure gets up and holds that thing up, you know what he says to that wafer? He says, My Lord, my God. Right. Amen. Latin or English. Then takes it down. It's called the monstrance. Now that 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 Dunlap was a character boy. That fellow was a character, and that old boy uh, he uh, knew he knew a false healer when he saw one. Years ago, down there in uh, in uh, oh it was uh, Georgia, Macon, Georgia. I had a meeting with a fellow named uh, C. C. Sheehan. And one day, while we were in the afternoon during the meeting, he took me around to a house a fellow uh, named Douglas Smith. He said, I want to have you meet Douglas. He said, Douglas, the fellow that got saved and called to preach, went off to Tennessee Temple for a while, and he said, and he got sick and got bad sick and got sicker and sicker, and now they think he's dying. And he said, I want to have you go by and talk to him. I said, okay, I'll go by and talk to him. So I went by Doug Smith's house and looked at him and met him. He was about six feet two, must have weighed about 120, crutches, brace, and we got talking. You know, he told me, he said, I got saved and called to preach, you know. And he said, I didn't want to preach. He said, I didn't want to preach. And he said, I didn't want to preach. And God wanted me to preach, and I wouldn't preach. And he said, so I injured my back. And he said, I injured my back, and I injured pretty bad. And the doctors told me, now, you better take care of that back. Don't let that happen again. If you do, you're liable to wind up on crutches. But he said, uh, I, I decided against the call to preach, went off to Tennessee Temple to preach. And as he got to Tennessee Temple to preach, you know, and when I was there, I got tired of the way they did things. I decided I'd quit school. So I quit school and injured my back again. And he said, that time I went to the doctor, they operated on my back, and they put me on crutches for a while, and said, now, if you injure that back one more time, you're going to get the place where you can't walk. And they wouldn't let him walk for about two or three weeks in the hospital. You know he did? He went down, he... Surrendered and said, I'll go back to Tennessee Temple. He got on his crutches, and he went down the kitchen of the hospital, worked his way down that kitchen, got in there, 
and got him a butcher knife about eight inches long and put his crutches down on the table there and took that butcher knife up by his throat and he says, God, if I can't walk, I'm going to kill myself and turn around and walk and walk and put up the butcher knife and they went back to Tennessee Temple. And he got out there and began to preach, but he said, you know something, Brother Ruckman? He said, uh, I began to pull string the Southern Baptist Convention and pull string with pastors to get a meeting here and meeting there, and pretty soon I hurt my back again. He said, I've been a brave since. They began to cry. And he said, you know, he said, Ruckman, he said, it's uh, hard for you to understand. He said, I'll try for you to understand. He said, but I was raised in a place where, you know, I just had to take care of myself. I had to take care of myself all my life. And he said, you just have any idea how hard it is for me to learn how to trust God. And of course, I knew exactly what he was saying. I knew exactly what he was saying. So it's been difficult for me. I've had to take care of myself since I was, <laughs> well, I was 14 years old. I was cooking meals for my 10-year-old sister because Mama passed out the table and I dragged her to the bed and leave her there unconscious. She's a chronic alcoholic. I raised one of those neighborhoods where a guy learns how to smile at you before he hits you, you know. I'm seeing the guy, right before a fellow hits, and a sucker punch, he'll kind of, his, his eyes will kind of swim up before he, before he hits. And you can tell when it's coming, but if he's smiling, <laughs> you don't know when he squints. It's all kinds of anger, you know. And he said, it's been hard for me to trust God. And uh, I guess he's, I'm sure he's dead by now. That meeting was more than 30 years ago. I'm sure he's dead. He just saved anybody in this building. But he lost his health. You can lose your health. That is no, you can lose your life. You know, Paul says in the book of Romans, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. You know, Paul says in Corinthians, he says, if any man defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, him shall God destroy. God can take you home ahead of your time getting out of fellowship with the Lord. I tell the young men that come down to our school, I tell them all the same thing, and I've told them the same thing for 31 years. The most important thing in your life, the most important thing in your life, the most important thing in your life is your personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing takes precedent over that. Soul winning, giving, tithing, attending, your personal fellowship with Christ is the most important thing for you to take care of, and if that's taken care of, the rest will take care of itself. Well, these guys get messing like swagger and these fellows get into. And I don't, I don't go, not, I feel sorry for them. I know how they get in those messes. They just get out of fellowship with the Lord in their private life. It all becomes ministry, 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 ministry. You can get so far in the ministry, you lose that thing where you and the Lord are working together. Then, boy, down comes the gate somewhere. The boom hits you. You got to stay in fellowship with the Lord. You go, or you can lose your life. Uh, and and uh, you take, uh, you take, uh, we had a fellow come down to our school one time, his name was Spinks, Richard Spinks, from Dayton, Ohio. And he came down there, he mother, mother, I always did like the guy. I always liked those kind of odd, peculiar, you know, rough guys. I always give them benefit of a doubt. Maybe I shouldn't sometimes, some of them were real con artists. But I always did like old Richard Spinks. If every man had guts, he had guts. He had more guts than good for him. You've been an old street fighter from up there at Dayton. He'd come down there. You know that guy would do? I've seen him walk through a crowd of hippies and yippies with their guitars and stuff. Right through them. I mean, a couple of hundred of them. At, sitting at the top of his lung, Jesus loved me, this I know, because the Bible tells me right slap through him, you know. Good man. But he is kind of a queer, odd character. He'd, uh, he never could get into anything. His mind was always kind of floating off. And he'd tell me one time, I see sex symbols in the Greek when I study it. I thought to myself, my God, man, if you can see sex in Greek alphabet, you, you do have a problem, boy. <laughs> and so I tried to help the guy out. You mean, I mean, these guys from up north come down there, a lot of them don't know anything, you know. They, they, um, they never hunted, they never fished, they never grown the crops, they're just, you know, silly. Jack Patterson from Detroit, he never saw a cow till he was 17. <laughs> Honest to God, he saw a cow coming down through Indiana to the school. That was the first cow he ever saw, 17. I take him down there and try to show him how to hunt, you know, dove and quail and that kind of stuff and be a help to him. And I, I this guy Spinks, so I took him out one night fishing. About midnight, I, I threw a cast net, about a 12-foot net off this railroad bridge. He got on that railroad bridge at night, you know, and cast him for the fish when they come through. I took him up there and we rocked out together and got that railroad bridge and said, sure, beautiful night, ain't it? He said, yeah. I said, look at, look at that moon on that, the moon reflecting the water out there. Boy, boys, man, it's a night, ain't it? He said, I'll small talk, small talk. 
And I said, boy, maybe a small talk, but sometimes a small talk is safe. You know what happened then? He wasn't 23 years old. He came up here and got a job as a painter and was painting the roof of a church and got 220 volts. Just turned him black. That fellow never lived to be 23 years old. It just took him out. Something was wrong there. I'll never know what it was, but something there very definitely was wrong. Bad wrong. You know, they go out different ways, you know. The British say when a fellow dies, he pops off. <laughs> you know, that over in America, they expire. Oh, hockey players, old hockey goalies never die. They just get all puckered out. <laughs> but crap shooters go like that. <laughs> That's funny, folks. I know some of you know that. That's, that's funny. <laughs> they go like that. All right, you can lose your life. One more and be through with it. You can lose your inheritance. What is your inheritance? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How thou rule over ten cities. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Have rule over five cities. And when you come back, if we suffer with them, if we suffer with them, we shall reign with them. No suffering, no reigning. He says in Colossians, you receive the reward, give the reward of the inheritance. A lady, a young lady was dying one time, and she'd get up there, she's about 25 years old, and she'd get up there and walk in front of the mirror. They told her to stay in bed, and she didn't stay in bed, and they came in the room there one time and found her standing in front of the mirror looking at it, and they said, what is it, honey? What is it, something wrong? She said, call them back, call them back, call them back. And they said, call back what? She said, the hours I've wasted. The hours I've wasted. The hours I've wasted. I got a guy to Christ one time uh, in a poor folks home who was about 72 years old and he was hurting pretty sick. And he got saved, sure enough, got saved. And after he got saved, I came to see him the next day and he was crying. I wonder if he was hurting. And he said, no, I'm not hurting. And I said, well, there's, you know, people haven't been to see you and that kind of thing. He said, no, that isn't it. And I said, what are you crying about? You just been saved? He said, yeah, I'm glad I'm saved. And I said, what are you crying about? He said, I've just been thinking about all the years I wasted. All gone. And boys and girls, time flies. She flies. I'm pushing 78. And I remember telling my mama day before yesterday, Mama, I can't come home from school that way because those big sixth graders will get me. <laughs> those big sixth graders. Man, by the time you finish college, you think the draft of fellow at 18 is a sin. He's just a kid. Here today, call him tomorrow. Call him back, call him back, call him back, call him back. Can't call him back. Inheritance. Uh, to my wife, I leave this. To my children, I leave this. To so-and-so, I leave this. I bequeath so-and-so this. So-and-so gets the horse. So-and-so gets the house. So-and-so gets the car. I saw a cartoon one guy and the guy reading out that thing and he reading out that thing and, and the, the will says, and to Wilbur, hello Wilbur. <laughs> That's what he got out of it. And to Wilbur, hello Wilbur. <laughs> Wilbur. You want to have that be your case? I don't think so. I don't think so. Off of the Great Lakes uh, Naval Air Station, I got a friend up there as a uh, missionary to the, ser the servicemen up there, the Naval Air Station of the, the sailors. And uh, he told about a case, I'll never forget, a fellow he led to the Lord, and the fellow's name was Schneider. And Schneider was not a uh, naval air station base up there. And Schneider was, uh, came back, they sent him back to Vietnam, and they sent him back to America to die, really. Because he, uh, that fellow had every kind of, he had every kind of dope and drug you can imagine. And that fellow was a walking pharmacy. I mean, he had everything for years. He'd been in every hellhole in China and Korea and just living like the devil and had a VD and stuff, and he was dying. He's up there in the hospital, and every time he'd walk, this friend of mine walked by his room and start in, he'd say, I don't need any help. Get out, preacher. You know, so he never paid attention to him. And after about, must have been, a, oh, six, seven weeks of that, and every time he'd try to go in, every time he'd be told to get out, after about six weeks of that, one day he went by there, and Schneider said, come here, preacher. And he came in the room and said, I need to talk to you a minute. And he said, all right, what is it? And he said, I've got a question I want to ask you. And this buddy of mine said, what is it? And he said, well, he said, how come you keep coming here day after day, day after day, day after day, and taking time out to see these fellows, and keep wanting to get in and talk to me, and i got no use for you, and cuss you out. Why do you keep coming back? And my buddy sat down and said, because I love you and want to see you saved. 
And Schneider sat back in that thing and looked at him and said, I don't know who would want to see me saved. He said, well, I want to see you saved. You know how to get saved? And Schneider said, no, tell me about it. <laughs> and he told him about it. And he preached, there must have been an hour in there, just stuffed the scripture on him, gave him a track. And old uh, uh, the Schneider wouldn't make a decision. He said, well, I'll talk to you about it later, preacher. You going to be back here tomorrow? He said, yeah. He said, all right. He said, I'll come back tomorrow. And he'll see you then. So off my buddy went. And Schneider stayed there in the bed. And long about, oh, about 9 o'clock, the nurse came in to give him the medicine to get him to sleep, barbiturates or bromides or something. And about 12 o'clock at night, she came back to the room. He was sitting straight up in the bed, just looking out in the room like that, just staring. And she'd give him enough pills, you know, to drop a horse. But, but he, he, he was used to it, you know. And he'd look out there, just staring out there like that. And she said, what are you doing? You're supposed to be asleep. He said, I'm thinking. Said, you're supposed to be asleep. You should have been asleep two hours ago. I told you, I'm thinking. <laughs> and she went back, got him a shot or something, you know, and a big old herpid hypodermic like you shoot a horse with, and came back, put a something in about 12.30 at night. At 3 o'clock, she came to him in the morning. He said, right in my bed. <laughs> Staring out in the dark. And she said, what are you doing awake? He said, lady, I told you, I'm thinking. <laughs> and she left. <laughs> and that, they gave up on him. To make a long story short, uh, in the morning, uh, in came uh, my friend to see him, and by then he'd been awake all night. Schneider had been awake all night. And he came in there, and, and uh, well, he said, he told me, he said, he said, when I walked in that room, and he said, took one look at that fella, he said, I knew he'd been saved. Amen. His face had all got, it was just glowing, and the eyes just sparkling. He said, that fella got saved. And he walked in there and said, morning, Snyder. He said, good morning, preacher. He said, did you get saved last night? And the Snyder said, I sure did. Amen. And he lived for three weeks after that, and then he died. And the last day before he died, he called, uh, he called uh, my buddy in there and said, I want to have you sit down and just sit there a while. He sat in the chair a while and uh, didn't say much. And after a while, he said, can I get you anything? He said, no, just, if you just sit there a while... And after he sat there about an hour, he said, well, he said, uh, I feel like I'm pretty useless here, but if you want me to stay, I'll stay longer. And he said, well, he said, I know you've got a thing to do, preacher, but would you stay about uh, 30 more minutes? And he said, all right. So he said, about 30 more minutes. After 30 more minutes, he got up to go, and he said, thank you, preacher. The preacher said, well, what was the good of me coming here, you know, and didn't, couldn't do anything for you or tell you anything? He said, well, preacher, he said, I've thrown my whole life down on the sewer and I'm getting ready to die and he said before I died I just want to spend a little time in the right kind of company Amen. let that be a lesson to you Amen. all right let's go to the Lord in prayer <clears throat> Father we ask you might bless the message tonight and bless the scripture and the truth we know this is the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth Thy words are truth, and they are spirit, they are life. We pray, Father, some Christian here that's near the brink of one of these things, you might uh, caution them and warn them and bring them back from the brink, for they have more problems than they already have. We're thankful, Father, for the, for the, the debt you didn't ask us to pay back. We, we reap what we sow, but thank God you didn't make us uh, reap everything we sowed. You've been merciful to us, and we thank you for it. Our Lord, maybe some of unsaved man, this building tonight, unsaved woman, and Lord, may they understand they can't get away with sin and eternity to pay off with eternal death just like it does now in physical death. May they not be led astray by inconsistent Christians and turned away from uh, those of us who are saved. We don't always do right. We don't always talk right. We don't always think right. We're still sinners. We don't want to block anybody's way. We pray with anybody in this building who doesn't know the joy of salvation, you might restore it to them and give them assurance of salvation. Anybody here tonight that doubts of salvation, You'll help them just to lean their soul and rest their soul in the naked word of God and bet their soul on what you said of being true, that you are true and won't lie to them. We pray this might be the night of the restoration of their joy and you and your their assurance in thee. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand. And pastor, if you would come here and call the service, the Lord lead you.